I just want to say that our, our outing last week to the theater was, was lots of fun. We went to see Amy for Brady, a bunch of us, there were nine of us, of women in that cal caliber of age that we enjoy that. <laughs> Some younger, okay? And it was good for all ages. <laughs> and, and I just, I found that on YouTube, there are quite a few uh, places where these four ladies have been interviewed by different uh, host talk show hosts. They are a hoot. It was a wonderful, fun, entertaining, and also heartwarming as to how women support women at, as they grow older. So if you haven't seen it, if you want something fun, go to the movie. Very good. Any other announcements? Jerry, men's breakfast is this Saturday, correct? Well, so nine o'clock something. Nine o'clock at Sunfields. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Now that the business of the day is done, let us prepare our hearts for worship. Steady our steps, O oh God, as we travel the journey set before us. Let us walk in the way of life and pursue the path of peace. Keep us on your course of life as we seek to be faithful. And as we gather to praise you, our faithful Lord and God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, still our minds, still our hearts. Be with us in our worship of you. Today is the day that you have made, and let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Now please stand and greet one another. Exactly. You can eat chocolate or whatever 
where you give up on Sundays. But there's been a new thing that a lot of Presbyterians have been doing is instead of giving up something, they take on something. Like they do something that they wouldn't normally do, maybe random, random acts of kindness. And Lynette was telling me that in the schools, it's going to be, what? Kindness Week is in a couple weeks? Next week. Next week. And so the schools are doing a lot with the idea of kindness. And we heard last week that Burton has started a kindness program in his school. His mom was telling us, you, I think you all were down at Sunday school already. But what are some of the things we could do to be kind? Yeah, yeah, drive through, pay for the <clears throat> Yes. Has that ever happened to anyone? Have you been your coffee been paid for in the dark drive through? Mm -hmm. That happened to me once. It was very, very nice. Anything what else, Lane? What can we do to be kind? Say I love you. Say I love you. And that's perfect for Valentine's Day coming up. Saying I love you to people. What about you, Olivia? Smiling at someone you don't know. Yes, it's very important. I think sometimes we get too into our own heads and thinking about what we have to do that we forget to look up and smile at people. So that's very good. The reason we do this is because Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness. And he did this to prepare himself for his ministry. It was the beginning he was baptized, and then he went off into the wilderness, and he didn't eat, he didn't drink for 40 days. And he just prayed and listened and prepared himself for his ministry to serve God. So we remember at Lent to do that, too, so we are prepared to be servants of Jesus and of the Lord and be present with the Holy Spirit all of our lives, right? Because kindness doesn't just happen once a week, one week, right? It's forever. So we want to be good servants of God. Okay, Lent. Can you say Lent? Forty days. Before Easter. Yes, yes. And next week we'll talk about what Ash Wednesday is, because that's the beginning of Lent. All right, let us pray. Dear Lord, as we prepare our hearts for the very huge gift you gave us in dying for our sins and in rising again and conquering death on Easter, may we be present to what you are calling us to do and be. Amen.
shadows of our isolation, God speaks the words of life and community. Through God's graceful healing present, God redeems our wounds and restores us to wholeness. So trusting in this, that God does this, let us pray together our prayer of confession. Generous God, we are baptized as your people, called to live and serve together as your church. We confess that we have sought to live for ourselves not reaching out to others and honoring the divine image in all of the children. Forgive us, we pray, in your abundant mercy. Give us the grace to be your church, confessing our faults, offering forgiveness, and working for reconciliation. Turn our hearts to your intentions that we may hold fast to one another and draw near to your presence. In Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Amen. In Jesus Christ, we have been fed God's grace and redemption. And that redemption gives us strength to love our neighbors near and far, proclaiming in our words and deeds, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen.
from Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 37. The New Living Translation. The Faith of the Gentile Woman. Then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre. He didn't want anyone to know which house he was staying in, but he couldn't keep it a secret. Right away, a woman who had heard about him came and fell at his feet. Her little girl was possessed by an evil spirit, and she begged him to cast out the demon from her daughter. Since she was a Gentile, born in Syria and Phoenicia, Jesus told her, First I should feed the children, my own family, the Jews. Isn't it right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs? Or it isn't right, sorry, to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs? She replied, That's true, Lord, but even the dogs under the table are allowed to eat the scraps from the children's plates. Good answer, he said. Now go home, for the demon has left your daughter. And when she arrived home, she found her little girl lying quietly in bed, and the demon was gone. Jesus heals a deaf man. Jesus left Tyre and went up to Sidon before going back to the Sea of Galilee and the region of the Ten Towns. A deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him, and the people begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man to heal him. Jesus led him away from the crowd so they could be alone. He put his fingers into the man's ears. Then, spitting on his own fingers, he touched the man's tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Mithapha, which means, be opened. Instantly, the man could hear perfectly, and his tongue was freed so he could speak plainly. Jesus told the crowd not to tell anyone, but the more he told them not to, the more they spread the news. They were completely amazed and said again and again, everything he does is wonderful. He even makes the deaf to hear and gives speech to those who cannot speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I remember that this story from scripture is one that, that I spent a whole class studying in seminary. It was a Bible class and she really wanted us to focus in on this scripture. I remember thinking two things. I don't recall hearing this story ever before. And also thinking, Jesus, why would you turn this woman away? You never turn people away. It is hard to read his reply initially to the woman, even today. To help make sense of it, we need to look at what came before. What was Jesus doing before this story? And it comes right after Jesus' teaching about inner purity to the Pharisees. And as Pharisees often do, they were questioning what Jesus and his disciples were doing. They are, of course, upset, which seems to be a common theme for the Pharisees. And they're upset because the disciples are performing certain rituals incorrectly. The disciples aren't washing their hands correctly. They aren't eating the correct foods. And the Pharisees are like the ritual police of the day. They watch and they call out when they see something. So Jesus, as Jesus often does also, takes this opportunity to use their criticism as a teaching moment and calls to the crowd to come and hear. All of you listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. So Jesus is spending time before this woman comes to him teaching about what it means to have a good heart. He's teaching the Pharisees and in turn teaching his disciples and then also in turn teaching the crowds. And then he travels north to the region of Tyre. Jesus tries to go to a house and likely wants to rest as he does not want anyone to know which house he is staying at. We know through scriptures when Jesus goes off alone or tries to hide, it is a time that he needs quiet. He needs rest. Jesus did become tired. Jesus wants to take a moment to himself. This part of the story reminds me of the lesson of the cup. If your cup is empty, how can you possibly fill another one's cup? 
Jesus is teaching us about self-care as he tends to the human part of him. So yes, this is a story about Jesus' humanity. He's already performed a healing of a Gentile in the Gospel of Mark, so it seems strange that he would talk to this woman in such a manner. It's very uncharacteristic of Jesus to be rude. But he does give a response to Jesus, and it seems out of place. And what are we to learn from this? Could the story of the Zero-Phoenician women be a kind of conversion moment of Jesus? in which he realizes how, maybe in a very human moment of physical and mental exhaustion, that he has lost sight of the point of his mission and has to be reconnected with it by someone assumed to be outside of it. And she was, to the Jewish people, considered an outsider. So then, for Mark, the woman is more than simply someone who crosses the path of Jesus. She is in some ways a prophet. She is the embodiment of Isaiah 49, 6, which reads, You will do more than restore the people of Israel to me. I will make you a light to the Gentiles, and you will bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. The prophet Isaiah clearly states that Jesus came into this world for Jews and Gentiles alike, meaning his ministry was all-inclusive. And he needed, in this moment, the courage of the woman to confront Jesus himself. And this confrontation changes him. She is important to the story so important that she rebukes Jesus, straightening him out and opening him up. Mary Ann Tolbert argues it is the woman's culturally unconventional and even shameful request, since it is not coming from the male member in her family, that draws the wrath and disdain of Jesus, not simply the fact that she is a foreigner. So it's interesting that this is right after he corrects the Pharisees over this same thing. Further, she bests him in an argument that ensues. It is the Gentile woman who teaches him, the Jewish man, the true meaning of what he has just reminded his own followers in the verse prior. That social convention should not stand in the way of helping those in need. So in this moment, she opens Jesus' heart. The meeting between the two of them is followed by the story of the deaf man who cannot speak, which serves as an example of how being opened up empowers us to be opened up to others. So again, that image of the cup we must fill our own cup to fill the cups of others, and we must be open to not hide that cup in a cabinet in the way back, but bring it out for all. So these stories highlight the universal love of God and God's relationship with humanity and the major, strong faith of two Gentiles that allows them to witness to, to demand, and to participate with Jesus in his saving power. Even though they have both remained outside what is recognized as the community. So three points are illustrated in this story. The power of faith knows no boundaries. And number two, as God's anointed, Jesus is usually not understood and accepted in his true role by those closest to him. Mark's constant indictment of the disciples and his inclusion of this secret of Jesus, but instead by those who truly have faith. So let me say that in another way. Mark makes it obvious to us that Jesus' ministry is for everybody. That it's not just the chosen one, God's family, 
that see what he does. It's those outside of the faith. Their strength, their will to be part of the family that is also important. And Jesus' mission was always meant by God to go by, beyond the chosen people in order to fill God's universal plan for salvation and to attest to God's unlimited power of redemption. So we can't get caught up in us deciding who's in and who's out. So Mark isn't that subtle. He gives a political message that the kingdom of God transcends and erases any claims of the Roman Empire to being truly universal. Time and time again we see this in the scriptures, these examples of the world versus God. And this scripture here is no difference. The power of God is more than the power of the world. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we claim that to be true. And now I go back to Jesus' humanity. To be the Son of God, the Messiah must suffer. Not only at the hands of those of us who do not understand him, but also under the condition of his existence. The challenge of the human condition itself Otherwise, Jesus would not be fully human, and he was. And according to the tenets of process and liberation theology, he is also fully God, so fully divine. It's hard to understand how one can be fully human and fully divine, but Jesus must do this to understand what it is like for each and every one of us. Jesus cannot avoid suffering. And Mark provides an interesting way of seeing how the divine and the human can be completely combined in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus is fully God and fully human. Only if he can faithfully be opened to both at the same time. So he's learning. He's learning what his call on his life means. So I bring us back to what is our part in this story? What are we to learn from this story? Maybe it is to remind us that Jesus was human too. But maybe it is also meant to remind us that we need to speak up. We need to witness the word and follow, just as she did. She sought out Jesus. We need to demand to be included, just as she did. We need to demand to be seen. We need to share our needs. We need to share our stories. And then finally, and I think this is the most important part, is we need to participate. An important part of the process. We can't simply ask from God the things we need, the things we need to heal, to be whole. We need to participate in looking for those things. You can't only ask. You need to be part of the solution. For we are accountable to God. We are accountable to participate in our own healing. We are accountable <coughs> to ourselves and to others. We are witnesses to the humanity and the divinity and the love of Jesus Christ. May we actively pray and actively participate. Amen.
We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in one body of Christ, the Church. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through Scripture, engages us through the word proclaimed, claims us in the waters of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men to all ministries of the church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of people's long silence, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth praying. Come, Lord. Our call to offering comes now in the service, and it is better to give than receive, and God's words find fertile ground each time we choose to give of ourselves, our time, our treasures, our talents. And as Francine said at the beginning of the service, we will be having the Kenya Pancake Breakfast next week, and this is our mission of the month, Kenya Partnership. So let us gather our gifts and offer them to God.
Holy God, we bring before you the cares, the concerns, and the joys that occupy us. Dear Lord, we pray for those working to save others, like Chris from Inc. 180. We pray for a world where people do not harm or hurt or use and abuse other people. So we thank you for his ministry in Inc. 180. That he is shining your light through his talents and his time. We pray also for our other mission partners, including Kenya Partnership, for a trip planned by Lori and April and others to assist our partners there in the Yoruba Church. Be with them, be with us as we raise money next week. And we pray for those that have suffered from an earthquake in Turkey and Syria and Aleppo. Be with the people that have lost their homes. Be with those that have lost loved ones. Be with the towns and the cities and the countries and all places that need our help. May we pray without ceasing for them and get the help that they need. May people step in where they can and serve you and serve others. We remember also before you those who are at odds with one another in families, in neighborhoods, in workplaces, in communities. Please help with those divisions. Please help us to listen to one another, to hear each other, and to forgive. We remember before you today those who have physical needs, people who fear for their safety and well-being, people who are hungry or thirsty, people who are exhausted by the demands of life, people who are tired by the demands of caregiving, people who are sick or who will undergo surgery, and people who live with constant pain. We ask that you bring relief and rest. We remember those weighed down with needs of heart and soul, a worry that keeps us awake at night, grief that accompanies us everywhere we go, depression that clouds us, or an addiction that grips us and those we love. Lift all of these heavy burdens with the light and peace of your presence, we pray. Sustain us over the long journey toward health and wholeness and give us trust in you. Give us trust in ourselves and give us trust in those who love us and that we love. We remember before you not only our cares but also our joys. All the things that are life-giving a birthday celebrated, an anniversary enjoyed, a baby born, a new job, a new relationship, and a new day of your mercies. We give thanks that with you there is always a new beginning, a way where there is no way, hope beyond hope, and life beyond death. Give us the courage to trust you as we choose your life-giving path praying just as you taught us together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, that thy kingdom come, that thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the day of our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom. stand for our closing hand.
We see what is set before us, life and death, blessings and curses, God's way versus our way. So in our response to God's grace, may we leave this place knowing that we are loved, that we are made whole through Jesus Christ, and that we have the presence of the Holy Spirit. So go now in peace. Amen. Thank you.